Hello, I'm Professor Claire Rosbridge and welcome to my YouTube channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the different types of intervertebral disc disease. Later on in the video, I am going to show some pictures of surgery. And so if you are likely to be upset by that, then please don't watch this video. They're not very gruesome, but there is um, some uh, uh, pictures of some tissue. Um, I'm going to warn you before we see those. So the types of intervertebral disc disease that we're going to be talking about are those in the dog and the cat. And to understand that, that first we have to, to know what exactly is the intervertebral disc. And I, like many neurologists, describe it as being like a jam donut. Um, that is to say the outside part of the donut, the donut, is a, a fibrous outer coat called the annulus fibrosus, which is represented here. And then there's a liquid jelly centre, which is the nucleus pulposus. And the disc functions to provide support um, to the whole of the skeletal column. It allows movement in any direction. And with the cartilaginous vertebral end plates, which are like shock absorbers at the end of the vertebrae, they allow uh, absorption of shock. So we can think of the intervertebral disc as being a bit like a squidgy ball. You know, the, they are compressible and they allow that absorption of shock. And if you didn't have intervertebral discs, it would be like having a broom handle stuck up your back. You'd be completely rigid and you wouldn't be able to move in any direction. And it's those intervertebral discs which give you that flexibility. So if you're in a training um, for a neurology residency, then I thoroughly recommend that you read this paper and uh, the ones associated it from uh, Joe Fenn and Natasha Olby and the whole of the Canine Spinal Cord Injury Consortium. And this picture I'm going to uh, show you is taken from that open access journal really to illustrate this in, in real time. Um, I say th these are actual images, so if you find this a little bit gory, now's the time to take to turn away. But I think it's really very helpful to see this in real time because I know that when I was first taught about disc disease as a as a 14 year old child who took my dog uh, to her local vet uh, when that dog had a sore back, I didn't really understand what the disc was. And I imagined it was something that when it slipped, it moved from point A to point B and that you could push it back in from point B to point A. But actually, the, the it's not possible uh, to do that uh, because of the, the the structure of the disc. So the normal disc looks like this. This this red bit here is the intervertebral end plate. And what we're seeing is a cross section um, right down the center of the vertebrae. And the annulus fibrosus is this bit here. You see is a big uh, modified ligament that's connecting the two vertebrae together. And inside it is that clear jelly. Uh, that is the nucleus pulposa, equivalent to the grey ball that I've just showed you that is uh, infinitely compressible and, um, uh, um, uh, well, not infinitely compressible, but uniquely compressible, and uh, it gives you that movement. Now, what happens with intervertebral disc disease is that this nucleus pulposa degenerates, um, uh, uh, undergoes something called chondroid metaplasia, and it becomes calcified and degenerated. And you can see this, this is more like cottage cheese as opposed to jelly. And as a result, you cannot compress that disc. It's no longer squidgy. As time goes on, it gets more and more degenerate uh, and may it extrude, which is what we uh, uh, um, are going to talk about in, in future slides. So the first type of disc disease that we're going to talk about is an acute intervertebral disc extrusion. Now this has been called various things through the history and the most common other name that it's given is Hansen type one disc degeneration or sometimes chondrodystrophic uh, disc degeneration. And the reason for the chondrodystrophic is because this is associated um, with um, chondrodystrophism, which means uh, dogs with short limbs, like Dachshunds, French Bulldogs, Basset Hounds, um, Shih Tzus, um, uh, Sealy Ham Terriers, that sort of dog. So 
taking you back again. The disc, normal disc has this fibre outer coat and this liquid jelly centre, which means it can deform under, uh, under pressure, acting as a shock absorber. But in these chondrodystrophic dogs, early on in their life, by one year of age, and actually I've seen it uh, present at three months of age, you get replacement of the normal cells, which are coming from the notochord, um, in the nucleus pulposa by chondrocytes, that's cartilage um, cells, and they transform into this fibrocartage, which is called a chondroid metaplasia. It can no longer absorb shock. Eventually, the thinner parts of the annulus, which is unfortunately at the top of the disc or dorsal of the disc, just under the spinal cord, they tear and the disc contents extrude out. Hence, it's called a disc extrusion. And it's a little bit like toothpaste coming out of a tooth tube. And this is why you can't push a disc back in because it's not pushing a solid object back in. It's, it's like trying to put toothpaste back into um, a, a tube with a much smaller hole than a toothpaste tube normally has. Now, this intervertebral disc disease, it's not a new disease. This is one book I, I picked up in the in Hay on Y in one of those old second-hand bookshops. It's on canine distemper, and I was quite surprised because it was quite a big book. And I thought, what could they ever could they have found to write about canine distemper and make a whole book um, uh, in 1922, given that nowadays, if we were to give a lecture on uh, on, on, on canine distemper, it would just be that one one lecture, or perhaps only part of a lecture. Well, I flicked through the book and I found all sorts of pictures, um, and some of them were very obviously diseases that were not canine distemper. And I realised in those times that they uh, attributed an awful lot of things to canine distemper, which wasn't actually canine distemper. And I think it's quite poignant that this is a dachshund that they've drawn and a characteristic posture that a dachshund will have when when they're paralyzed due to intervertebral disc disease. But actually it had been reported, but it was thought to be a tumour um, in 1881 by Janssen. Um, it was called a chondroma mass compressing the spinal cord. And the first correct report was in 1939 from Tillman's, obviously published after this canine distemper book. And then the first good description was by Hansen. Uh, and that's where we get the Hansen type 1 and then also type 2 descriptions. So what happens in these dogs is they have early chondroid metaplasia, which means that the, the intervertebral discs will often appear calcified because they degenerate and then they calcify, which means on a radiograph, you may be able to see these calcified discs. This can be a little bit uh, uh, hazardous in a, in a radiograph because these are very, very easy to see. Not so easy to see is when they're no longer in position. And actually, this was the site of the disc extrusion in this dog. Um, it's a slightly more narrow disc. And the, and the obvious clue is that there is no calcified disc uh, at this site because it's all up in the canal. And unfortunately, we can't see the canal very well uh, because this uh, um, dog is a very barrel chested dog and the rib is in the way. And this is also a site where there is a possible candidate for a disc extrusion because we can see that the uh, top of the disc is being uh, is not the same, is not rounded like here, uh, and there's a sort of tail going off into the into the canal. And so this was probably a site of a previous disc, or perhaps the dog had two. So this chondroid metaplasia is associated with short-limbed conformation, um, and uh, uh, at least two mutations. So really short-limbed dogs like Dachshunds have both uh, mutations, and they uh, uh, and they have uh, two copies of the of both mutations. Um, but we also see um, this sort of mutation in any dog with shorter limbs. Uh, for example, this is the gene uh, that is found in the Nova Scotian ductoling retriever, which is obviously a, a retriever which is shorter uh, than uh, other retrievers uh, being selected for its fox-like shape. And of course, the reason why this disc, this disc disease has been around for a long time is because humans have selected dogs with short limbs for various different functions, originally to, um, to chase vermin or, or to um, uh, chase after rats and mice or, uh, or follow badgers into the set, as in the Dachshund, or to look like a fox, as in the Nova Scotian duck retriever. 
um, and we have selected those dogs for those different different types. Now nowadays most uh, short limb dogs are being selected for companions. This is a picture of an MRI scan um, uh, and I, I put it in here really so as to show you the different stages of disc degeneration. So just to orientate you here, this is the top of the dog's back. These are the vertebral bodies here. That's the renal artery coming off there. This is the aorta. And we've taken a section straight down the middle of the dog. Um, and we can see here that we have a normal intervertebral disc. So we have this fibrous outer coat of the annulus fibrosis and this liquid jelly shenta, which in this MRI scan is showing up as bright white. We can see that here and here, we're just losing the center of that disc because these little bits have degenerated a little bit, but not as much as here, as we see a completely dehydrated and calcified intervertebral disc, which is black. The site of the disc extrusion is here. And we can see that this disc, which is normally between the vertebral bodies, is now extruded up into the vertebral canal. And this is the spinal cord being compressed running along the top here. Um, not everybody has access to MRI, of course, and most vets that might be investigating for intervertebral disc disease will be taking um, radiographs, although um, those can be more difficult to interpret. So this is a cervical, a C2, C3 disc extrusion. Um, we have the normal disc space here, which is radiolucent, so you can't see uh, anything uh, in it. In this disc space, you can just about see that there is calcified material in it and then possibly calcified material up here. It's actually easier to see in the ventral dorsal uh, image. In ideal circumstances, you take out the endotracheal tube here, but we can tell that this intervertebral disc space is radiolucent. This one is much narrower and we can see disc material within it. So radiographs can be a good indication that the animal has an intervertebral disc disease, but it doesn't prove uh, um, intervertebral uh, 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 disc extrusion or compression of the spinal cord. And you need further imaging um, to be able to do surgery. I just want to show you the comparison between this. This is the same dog and a CT scan. We don't normally do all of that imaging. It was done uh, in this dog for teaching purposes, obviously with the owner's uh, permission. And we can see now that it's so much clearer to see that calcified material in the intervertebral disc space. And we can also see that there is a massive blob of it in the vertebral canal uh, that's uh, going to be very difficult uh, for the body to deal with under natural circumstances and would probably do better to have surgical management. This is the other advantage of CT is that you can make a slice um, in any direction. So this is it reformatted in what we call the sagittal plane. So the head is here, C2 vertebrae is here. These are the vertebrae associated with the ribs. And here is a section through there and we can see again this blob of material and we know that it's going towards the left which will help us with our surgical planning. Uh, many places offer MRI and this is the same dog with comparison on MRI um, and uh, one of the reasons for, for MRI is that it can help you to actually see the structure of the of the spinal cord and it's particularly important when we're looking at other types of disc disease. So we can see the hydrated discs here we can see that this disc is not hydrated and again the great big, big blob of material which we can see is to the left and see how it's compressing this poor little nerve root here i mean this dog was be, was in a lot of pain and also had a lot of spasm of the muscles on the left side of the head in some breeds uh, you can have a disc extrusion and it can tear the internal vertebral plexus and you can get a lot of bleeding uh, so much so that there can actually be a hematoma pressing on the spinal cord as well as disc material. In fact, the disc material is often a very much smaller part of that. And in my experience, this is particularly so with the French Bulldog. And um, there's a breed that gets a, a great uh, prevalence of intervertebral disc disease and also in the German Shepherd Dog and, and crosses. And it's sometimes 
uh, thought that it may be associated with larger epidural spaces in in those uh, in those breeds compared to the say the dachshund which has uh, a very uh, narrow spinal canal. It's often extremely painful, um, presumably because the blood releases its own uh, inflammatory mediators. Uh, so we can see in here, this is a sagittal image coming along here. And all of this black that you can see here is actually hemorrhage. Um, we can see uh, here that, again, this black is taking up half of the vertebral canal. So this is a section right through the uh, vertebral canal. This is the vertebrae here. And this is the hole where the spinal uh, cord is. And uh, I'm just going to see if I can uh, go to a much narrower little um, uh, a highlighter here. All of this round here is all hemorrhage, hematoma, and the little bit next to it is the spinal cord compressed. Now you may have uh, uh, be challenged in, in um, uh, determining that that is hemorrhage and so very useful to do in those circumstances a gradient echo uh, which very nicely shows the black of the hemorrhage. And I guess if you if you wanted to, you could also give a gadolinium contrast. The main reason for doing that would be to make sure that this you weren't dealing with a blood filled tumor like a hemangiosarcoma, especially as this was a German shepherd dog. Of course, it wouldn't have happened per acutely as it did in this dog. But in a hemangiosarcoma, you would get very even enhanced with with contrast material, whereas this you only get it round the edge. And I also show you this image here just to show you how this is a great big hematoma really lying by the side of the spinal cord. We can see intervertebral disc disease in cats, which is very similar to, um, to that in dogs. Um, we can do, this was a routine thoracic radiograph in this cat. We were investigating for not disc disease, but you can just see uh, that this, this cat does have a calcified disc here. And I, uh, I think there's one here as well. Um, this is a, a, a cat that was presented with intervertebral disc disease. We can see the calcified disc here, but this is actually the site of, of, of the problem. Um, uh, this disc space is much narrowed. We can see sclerosis of the end plates here. We can see narrowing of the foramen here. You can see a kind of horse's head here. If you can try and draw that. Uh, this is the sort of classic shape of the foramen is a sort of horse's head like that and you're gonna to have to take my word for it there because I can't draw very accurately on PowerPoint whereas when we look at it here it's very very much smaller here um, barely visible at all so uh, this is actually the site of the uh, disc extrusion um, and this, it, the one next to it is just an indication that it has intervertebral disc disease. So um, uh, again, it shows you how uh, um, uh, radiographs can be helpful, but not actually prove it. And in fact, um, in the inexperienced vet would be drawn to this and completely miss, miss this. Here's a CT of a cat. Um, we can see different types of, of, uh, uh, of stage of disease. So there's a nice calcified disc here. Um, this is uh, some remnants of calcified material here. And then you, we can see just the blush of calcified material in the actual canal, which is which compressing uh, um, the spinal cord. And then we can see uh, this very old and chronic disc here with sclerosis of the, uh, of the end plate. Presumably this was an old disc extrusion, which was um, managed either non-surgically or was clinically silent in that cat. So this is uh, acute disc extrusion associated with uh, early degeneration of the disc and then calcification and then quite early uh, disc extrusion in these dogs, usually this, um, uh, between the ages of one and seven, although it can really be up to any, uh, any age in a predisposed dog. Now we're going to talk about chronic intervertebral disc protrusion. Um, uh, so uh, this is um, what was used to be called, and still is in many, uh, in many people's books, Hansen type 2 disc degeneration. Now it used to be called, um, uh, I think that this, the pathology behind this was very different from the uh, chondrodystrophic dogs, but actually it's been shown more recently that it's actually very much similar pathology. It's just that it occurs much, much more slowly 
uh, and age associated in these non-condodystrophic dogs, so things like Labradors uh, and, uh, um, and, the, and the larger breed dogs. And this is similar to the disc disease that we get uh, in, in humans. So again, we have the normal disc is a fibrous outer coat and a, and a liquid jelly center. It's all squishable, but then we get this um, uh, 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 degeneration that we used to think was fibroid but actually is chondroid um, but it's just much slower than the chondrodystrophic dogs and then this uh, material is pushed into the layers of the annulus causing it to bulge so you get this bulging herniated disc that is protruding rather than the burst extruded disc that you get in the, in the chondrodystrophic disease. So this is associated with many different types of disc disease. And there may be predisposing factors, for example, caudal spherical spondylomyelopathy, wobbler syndrome, um, or lumbar sacral intervertebral disc extrusion as, we're, uh, 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 as I've imaged here. Really, this is a each one of those is a whole subject in themselves. So I'm not gonna dwell on it too much. I'm just going to describe this one uh, image. So we have uh, the, uh, uh, the end of a spine in a dog here. This is the sacrum. This is L7. Um, and this is going towards the tail. This is going towards the head. And what we see here, the end of the spinal cord, which is called the corda equina, because you have lots of nerves that are going down and uh, uh, like a horse's tail. And we can see this big bulge here. So these poor little nerve roots are being compressed by this big bulge and also a little bit from uh, the ligamentum flavum, which is which is hypertrophied from from below. And because this is a dynamic joint, this will be more pinchy in certain uh, in certain configurations. So when the dog is jumping or going upstairs, so you get that acute little hourglass pinch. Ouch. Um, when the dog is doing certain activities. And we can also see that the disc is bulging and compressing into the, into the neuroforamen. And so this dog may actually present with lameness because of compression of the L7 nerve roots. And, and in humans, we call that sciatica. So this is a bulging disc. It's managed quite differently from the, uh, from the other uh, disc disease. We're not going to go into surgery uh, in this one video. It's going to be a subject for uh, future videos. Um, and, uh, and, and that's really because you don't have free fragments of discs, you have this, this bulge. So the next type of disc uh, extrusion we're going to talk about is acute compressive hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion. So what this basically is, is that uh, you have a normal hydrated nucleus pulposus and some trauma happens. So, for example, this was a Jack Russell Terrier who was on, on restrained on a leash and collar. So, you know, beautifully behaved dog walking under control and unfortunately attacked by a dog out of control, not on a leash or collar and not under uh, control from the owner. So the poor dog was attacked whilst having a collar around its neck. Um, so it suffered some considerable neck trauma um, and uh, we hypothesized there was a very small tear in the annulus fibrosis which allowed the normal liquid content of this disc to come out. So the salient features on the MRI scan is that we see that there is um, a, a much reduced size to the nucleus pulposus. Just ignore this disc degeneration here that's irrelevant to this dog. We can see a little tiny like blip in the annulus fibrosis, which is probably the little tear. And then we can see a lot of, uh, of white material, unlike the degenerate material we saw in the last MRI scans, we can see a lot of white hyperintense material, which has the same um, uh, signal as uh, a CSF, but also the same signal as intervertebral disc that is compressing the spinal cord. And this dog did have surgery um, from a colleague um, because this dog was actually cyanotic, um, uh, was not uh, moving his diaphragm. The uh, compression was so severe and affecting those C5 uh, spinal cord segments um, uh, that uh, are going to the, uh, to the diaphragm in that area. When we do a, a axial image through there, we can see the compression of the spinal cord and it has a a bilobed shape because of the ligaments in that area, which some people have referred to as the seagull sign. Now you have to imagine that this is the body 
of the seagull and those are the wings of the seagull uh, coming out. And so that's how to distinguish that on, uh, on MRI scan. In, in some cases, they don't need to have surgery. And um, there was actually a nice uh, paper that came out of the Royal Veterinary College, which suggested that they do very well on uh, conservative management. But obviously, if they are not able to breathe, then you need to get that, um, that compression away. So that is compression of the spinal cord because of an extruded nucleus pulposa, but unlike the dachshunds, etc., this is a normally hydrated jelly-like material. The next uh, disc protrusion, extrusion, rather, we're going to talk about is a non-acute, non-compressive nucleus pulposa extrusion, uh, which is often uh, uh, abbreviated to ANNPE. It's also sometimes known as a type 3 disc extrusion, and that makes reference to Hansen, um, except Hansen didn't describe this type of uh, disc extrusion, so it's just a type 3, or a high velocity, low volume disc extrusion. I have to, have to admit, um, I prefer the high velocity, um, low volume disc extrusion for explaining uh, to my clients. So this is a bullet. Um, it's a, a, a souvenir, I guess, if you could call it that, from when I was an intern uh, in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, um, because uh, dogs don't generally get shot in the, the UK, especially not with bullets like this. Um, this was removed from a dog. Um, so this is a, a bullet that comes from a high velocity uh, rifle. But as you can see, that it is a really small bullet. Um, uh, uh, generally, I mean, it won't do me any harm, just like this. I can throw it up and down in my hand and, uh, and it's not going to damage my hand. But if I was to fire that at my hand uh, from a high velocity rifle, then it would take my hand off. So the principle that I'm trying to explain is that in a non-compressive nucleus pulposa extrusion, you have a very small amount of disc material which is hitting the spinal cord at high velocity and it's that conducive element to it um, that that causes the damage rather than an extrusion of material which is compressing the spinal cord and typically these are non-chondrodystrophic dogs so uh, and typically they're fit dogs uh, because it's associated with high impact uh, activity often twisting activity uh, when the dog is running or jumping. So, for example, chasing um, uh, uh, after a bird, leaping up for a fr frisbee, uh, running downstairs very quickly. Um, and it's thought to be this kind of shearing action, which, which is, is responsible for this very small amount of material leaving the disc and impacting the spinal cord. We don't know so much about the pathophysiology really because we have to hypothesize uh, because it's actually very rare that dogs uh, will be um, uh, post-mortemed, uh, well, be bad enough that they will be euthanized and then post-mortemed. Uh, and so we, uh, most of the dogs that have this, uh, which are then managed and, um, uh, for it with physiotherapy, um, and uh, other supportive care do make a recovery. And of course, in those dogs, apart from the MRI, uh, we will never be able to f further find out what went on. But the, in some rare cases, the postmortem has revealed small tears in the dorsal annulus fibrosis, and then there's found non-degenerated pulse uh, pulposa material, but not as much as, uh, as in the last case within the spinal canal. So it's that concussive injury. So typically on an MRI scan, what you will find is uh, very mild changes to uh, the intervertebral disc. So a sort of loss of the nucleus pulposa, as indicated by the uh, arrow here, uh, or very um, s uh, slight narrowing. There'll be no spinal cord compression, but overlying this, you'll see some an intramedullary um, T2-weighted hyperintensity, which is uh, has the same signal as intrathecal edema or, um, or um, possibly vascular changes. It's overlying that, that disc material. Uh, the dogs will present per acutely with non-progressive signs during that uh, twisting 
um, activity or in some cases you know about 30 percent of them uh, owners don't even know what the dog did they just come down in the morning and find the the, the dog uh, like that uh, here's another example um, this was a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, uh, one of the typical breeds, and doing a typical Staffordshire Bull Terrier thing, chasing a pigeon and didn't see that the fence was coming up and then uh, very rapidly twisted. Uh, so it's a sort of per acute signs. The dog initially yelled out, screamed, vocalised. The owner thought it was uh, uh, naturally thought the dog was painful, but when the vet later examined the dog, they actually found non-painful over over the, uh, the spinal cord, even though the dog was distressed. There was no pain, and that's typical. No pain. Um, again, we can see this very um, uh, small amount of change in the vertebral disc, slight reduction in the nucleus pulposa signal and volume, and then this change in the spinal cord above. And actually this one has a very dark signal as if there is um, uh, blood within the spinal cord. And this dog did, uh, although he was a, a paraplegic at the event, did very, uh, uh, had an excellent outcome uh, with physiotherapy only. Here's another one. It's uh, an eight-year-old um, Labrador. He was chasing a squirrel and he yelped and uh, instantly uh, paralyzed um, uh, grade three myelopathy, which means that they're paraplegic. Um, and again, we can see um, uh, that not so much change in this disc, but I'm going to show you another image later that will help convince you, I think. There's a bit of spondylosis. Um, this is a uh, um, not significant. Um, spondylosis is a common change in a large breed dogs um, and it's just a sign of some degenerative changes in the annulus fibrosis. You can think of it as uh, uh, as, uh, as a, a stake to uh, around a, a plant like an apple tree to help support it. So it's not a sign of disease or pain, although many people say that it that, that it might be. They are wrong. Um, so a little bit of spondylosis, but no main changes in, in, in the uh, intervertebral uh, disc itself in this image. Um, we can see this high signal above the disc and we can see in this stir image that it's very asymmetrical. And actually in the axial image, you can see that it's really a, um, a extremely asymmetrical. And in this dog, uh, it's difficult to say whether or not it is um, a, a, an acute um, uh, uh, non-compressive disc extrusion um, or whether it's a fibrocartilaginous embolism which we're going to talk about in the next image. On the basis that the pathology is just above the disc um, I, I said that it was the, uh, the former. I'm just going to convince you here that this is uh, associated with disc pathology by showing you an axial through the actual disc there you can see it's bean shape, which I drew earlier, and then through normal disc. So now you can see that beautiful bean shaped nucleus pulposa and how much of it is gone in this. And uh, on the basis that quite a lot of it's gone and we've just got a tiny increase in signal around here. Uh, I'm going to call that an ANPE, although I'm uh, uh, willing to also argue that it could be a fibrocartilaginous embolism. So what is a fibrocartilaginous embolism? It's our, one of our last examples. So fibrocartilaginous embolism is um, often occurs during the same activity. Um, as um, uh, an ANNPE um, and uh, so high impact activity um, often associated with a twisting action but in this instance there is fibrous cartilage which embolizes into the blood supply to the spinal cord so it results in uh, an ischemic myopathy a simple way of describing it is like a stroke to the spinal cord, but the reason for the stroke is an embolism of fibrocartilaginous material in the blood supply to the spinal cord. And the source of the fibrocartilaginous uh, material hasn't been proven, but it's suspected to be nucleus pulposa. Um, there's various different uh, arguments um, that have been written in some excellent papers for that. If you um, if you uh, want to read further, and so it literally causes a spinal cord infarction. You um, often have subtle changes in the intervertebral disc space close to the spinal cord pathology, 
uh, and I know this is the disc because we re-imaged the dog and it, uh, and it had further dehydrated a few months later. Um, so I know that this was a disc with pathology and we can just say get a slight loss of signal. Um, and unlike the, uh, the ANPE that you're talking about before, you have um, a, a spinal cord lesions that are not overlying uh, the vertebral um, um, intervertebral disc, but over vertebral bodies, possibly because the, um, the, the material comes up that way. Uh, and it's all, in this instance is spread over several segments. This is one cross section through that segment here and, and often the material is in the grey matter which has a, a, a bigger vascular supply. Um, they're managed like ANMPEs. Um, so there's no surgical management of this. You can't go in and remove this, the, the, the disc material from the, uh, from the blood vessels because it's microscopic. You can't, you can't see it. Um, uh, and, but many dogs do do well, including, including this dog. So I'd like to talk to you in the final uh, part of this video of two, of two rare types of disc extrusion. The first is intradural disc extrusion. And this is a very strange event where the disc material extrudes, but instead of lying outside the spinal cord, including the meninges, the dura, where you'd expect it to be in the epidural space, um, it manages to get through a tear in the dura. We don't know how that happens. We think that it's probably that the dura attaches to the disc. And when the disc tears, the dura tears as well. And it ends up lying within the dura and this is one example in a dog and so um, it is actually difficult um, uh, to to uh, to see these um, but um, if you can get really close up you can see that they have a kind of split um, sign what we call a golf tee sign uh, due to there being something in um, uh, the intradural space, intradural extramedullary space. And the weird thing about this dog is he had two events. So whatever predisposed him to the first event also caused him to have a, a second event. And this is the picture of the surgery that's coming up. So if you don't like gore, then this, now's the time to, to close your eyes. I'm going to tell you when you can open your eyes again. It's not too gory though. Um, but this is a picture of his surgery. Um, and uh, um, I would say that what um, what is the giveaway when you do the surgery is that you expect perhaps to have um, lots of disc material, um, but you don't find it. You find no disc material, yet you know you're in the right place and um, uh, you know that there should be material there and you're on the right side. This is the so what we're seeing here is the spinous process and this is the hole. Uh, that's been made to get into the spinal canal to remove disc material. It's called a hemilaminectomy. And this is the spinal cord lying along here. And what we see is a bruise in this area. So something is going on in this area. And the, um, the very brave surgeon, my colleague uh, uh, Ricardo Fernandez, um, made a incision through the dura. So he did a durotomy. And as soon as he did this, this disc material started to ooze out and we can see the disc material that he removed there. Um, so this was a very successful outcome both times uh, in this dog um, thanks to that surgery. And the next image that I have to thank uh, Rick Glass for is an extension of that. So not only is the disc material extruded into the dura but it actually bursts through into the spinal cord itself and so what we're seeing here is an intramedullary disc extrusion. So what this is, is a section through the spinal cord. Uh, this is the outside dura. Um, uh, those that are, of you that are slightly sensitive can probably look now because this image, although it's of the spinal cord, is, is, is all sorts of dyed um, uh, in a pink way. So it doesn't look like a spinal cord. And what we can see here is a it's a sort of purple blob and spinal cord doesn't normally have a purple blob in it. That's the central canal. This is all destroyed spinal cord here. And when we uh, uh, focus in on that purple blob, what we can see is this is cartilaginous material. And we absolutely should not have cartilaginous material within the spinal cord. We can also see this pink hemorrhage that's associated with it. 
Um, and uh, I'd like you to focus on this area here, not this one. I'm, I'm skipping out this slide here. But this area here, so we see a lot of hemorrhage. And this is the top part of the spinal cord. So the disc, when it occurred, would have actually been down here. Uh, and we can see this great big blob. And when we actually go closer, again, it's a load of hemorrhage and it's a load of, of fibrocartilaginous material. So this is a really, um, this dog was obviously uh, post-mortem, hence we have the spinal cord. And this is obviously a very serious consequence of a disc extrusion that actually manages to penetrate not just the dura, but come out with so much force that it goes into the soft spinal cord itself. Um, but it is incredibly rare. Um, and I suppose an example of that is, is really why I've had to borrow material from uh, the, the, the very clever and eminent um, uh, Rick Glass to show that to you. So um, that concludes our journey through intervertebral disc disease. What I haven't included here is traumatic disc extrusions, really because um, uh, that it is associated with things like road traffic accidents and really is a very different pathology and better discussed under spinal cord trauma. Um, uh, but um, uh, having looked at all those donuts, I think uh, we're all really quite, uh, quite hungry now. So I'm going to say goodbye uh, and uh, maybe go and see if I can find some. So this video was the first in the series on intervertebral disc disease. And in later videos, we're going to talk about how intervertebral disc disease is diagnosed and managed and have a little bit on surgery and then perhaps go into some of the syndromes such as lumbar sacral disc disease, wobbler's syndrome and uh, similar, more complex disorders. Until then, goodbye.